Glad to have you back to the I Don't Want a Divorce podcast. Now, before today's topic, I will answer a question a podcast listener emailed to me. And by the way, feel free to email me your question to David E. Clark, PhD, Clark with an E on the end, David E. Clark, PhD, at gmail.com. Here is the question, and a very common one that I receive from wives, particularly. Hi, Dr. Clark. She says, my ultimate question is how long should my husband and I be separated before I either choose to move back in or choose to file for legal separation or worst case divorce? Of course, they're, they're separated now. She believes, and I tend to agree with what she's saying here, that her husband has narcissistic tendencies. That's probably even worse than that. He probably is a narcissist based on his behavior. And he has been emotionally abusing her for years. Through much praying and a lot of trying to do the right thing, talking to him, appealing to him about the hurt he's caused or the state of our marriage, tell him how I feel using I statements, requesting change, I eventually gave a two-month warning and said if the destructive behaviors didn't change, then I'd have no choice but to temporarily separate. You know, I I like that. It's exactly what she should have done, giving, giving him every opportunity. Well, this isn't a big surprise, but two months came. And I again appealed to him and he refused to take any responsibility. So I made the choice to move out. Well, good for you. Not easy, but the right thing. He asked for it. She says, now we are nearly three months into our separation with no evidence in his behaviors that he will take responsibility or change his destructive behaviors. He's never been physically abusive, but he is certainly emotionally abusive. And of course, he's proving that now like she needed proof. But he consistently pushes the blame on me and says things like, you're the one that left. Well, of course you left. This is me talking. Of course you left because he's abusive and you need to protect yourself. Of course, a narcissist never sees that. Why in the world would you leave me? Who would leave me? Now, she's pleading and she shouldn't be pleading, but she's pleading with with God, which I guess is okay. Don't plead to him to work a miracle in her husband's heart and, of course, bring him back to the table. So she's asking, How long is a separation supposed to last before I can determine that he will never change? How long do I wait before I do anything different, whichever option that becomes? Well, great question. I, of course, tipped my hand here a bit, but here's what I would say to this. Dear soul, your husband has consistently shown that he has no interest in taking responsibility for his sinful behavior. He would rather blame you than change. He probably truly believes that it's your fault. I recommend you read my book, Enough is Enough how to leave an abusive relationship, exactly what she needs. It will confirm that you did the right thing by leaving. If a husband loves his wife and she leaves him, he will do anything to win her back. I mean anything. Give me a list. This guy isn't that guy because he doesn't love her. I recommend you read the book. It's available only on my website, davidclarkphd.com. Cut off all contact with him and do whatever you have to do to prepare to live alone. Make sure you have the ability to support yourself financially before you really lower the boom and indicate you're done with him in terms of a separation at least. Make sure you're financially secure. So you can stall uh, until you're financially ready. And when you're ready, and the book will instruct you, you follow the Matthew 18 steps of confrontation laid out in the Enough is Enough book. If he won't budge, ask God for guidance Redivorce. If God releases you, you're free to move on. I'd recommend, and this is this is what's variable. You you will, and God will make it clear to you. It could be a three or four month separation, could be five or six. Most of that maybe you can kind of getting all your ducks in a row. But God will make it clear if He wants you to divorce or not, and you have to leave that in His hands. And I also recommend, and this is to all that are listening. Uh, and if it's not you, you may know someone that that could use this. I do phone advice sessions every single week, seven, eight, 10 of them from people across the country that are in marital crisis. So this may be helpful to make sure you have the right strategy in place. You wanna make sure you're doing what God wants you to do. Uh, These sessions are explained on my website, davidclarkphd.com. That's Clark with an E. If you have an abusive spouse, and this lady obviously does, and emotional abuse, by the way, is just as damaging, if not more so than physical abuse, or your spouse wants a divorce for bogus reasons, or you have sinned and driven your spouse to want a divorce, or whatever your marital crisis is, I can help. I've got a plan for every marital crisis. One of my books will help you. And of course, as I mentioned before, you can do a phone session with me. 
All that information, of course, on the website, davidclarkphd.com. Now, let's get to today's topic, continuing my series based on my book, Married But Lonely. And today's topic is, tell me how I shut you up. I've been seeing couples in therapy for almost 33 years now. 99% of all first sessions follow the same pattern. After taking a brief history of each person's background, I ask, tell me why you've come to see me. Immediately, one spouse launches into a recitation of the other spouse's faults. I listen for five minutes as this spouse rakes the other over the coals, covering every possible mistake he or she has made. Then I interrupt, and believe me, I have to interrupt and say, that's enough, I get the picture. Turning to the other spouse, I say, okay, your turn. That spouse typically starts weeping and responds, oh, all those charges are true. I'm guilty of every one of them. Guilty, I tell you. I'm a pathetic excuse, a pathetic excuse for a husband or a wife. That spouse goes to her knees and begs for a chance to change. Uh, Right. You know I'm kidding. Like that's ever going to happen. You know what happens. The other spouse launches into a litany of the first spouse's weaknesses and mistakes. After another five minutes, I say again, that's enough. Then I give my little speech that is the actual beginning of marital therapy, which goes like this. You've done an excellent job describing each other's faults. You're both right. We will address all the issues you mentioned, but focusing solely on your partner won't lead to real change in your marriage. It never does. Change comes when you look in the mirror, admit your faults, and make the conscious decision to work on them. So let's hear what each of you has done wrong in this relationship. Oh, they don't like that. They don't like that at all, but I know what I'm doing. It is fair and very important that you tell your partner what you want him or her to change. Fine. Yet it is equally important to face your own contributions to marital problems and do your own changing. So it's your turn in the hot seat. And I'm saying women, it could be a man if you, because the intimacy avoiding spouse could be a male or a female but I'll just talk to women here. Women, to this point in my husband transformation strategy, the central focus has been your husband. The needs in your life you want him to meet, the mistakes he has made that have hurt you and caused resentment, and the changes you would like him to make. As I have indicated, zeroing in on your husband is the best way to begin. If you start by revealing all your weaknesses, he will quickly write the whole thing off as your problem. So prior to this, you have gone after your husband in a very direct, upfront way, and you will keep being honest with him about your needs and what he can do to improve your relationship. However, the time has come to shift the focus to you. It is your turn in the hot seat. While there is no question that your husband does things that kill intimacy, get ready for some bad news. So do you. Yes, you. Even though you are the partner in the relationship who is working as hard as possible to achieve intimacy, you are just as guilty of snuffing it out. Without realizing it, you are enabling your intimacy avoider to remain an IA. You are doing specific behaviors that turn your husband off, push him away from you, and shut him up. I know you don't want to destroy opportunities for closeness with your husband. That is exactly what you're doing. What you must do is discover what behaviors of yours are killing your hopes of achieving intimacy and then eliminate them. Here is how to proceed. Again, everything in detail in my book, Married But Lonely. But here's the basic approach. First category is, please tell me the truth about me. You go to your husband and tell him you want to schedule a meeting. He will likely cringe and say, no, not another meeting. Give him your best smile and reply, don't worry, honey. I think you're going to like this one. It's not about your mistakes. It's about my mistakes. Don't give him any more information and set a meeting three or four days later. At this meeting, there are five messages you want to deliver. Here they are in the order in which they are to be communicated. First, I've been honest with you. Honey, as you know, this is you talking to him. Honey, as you know, I've been brutally honest with you over the past several weeks. I've shared my needs. I've shared my resentments over your actions in the past that really hurt and angered me. I haven't held anything back. I haven't softened the blow. Second message is I'll keep being honest with you. For the rest of our marriage, I'm going to keep on being honest. When you do or say something that significantly bothers me, I'm going to tell you. That's good for me, and it lets you know what I need from you. So you're going to keep speaking truth using the one-way communication strategies I covered in the last few podcasts. Third message, be honest with me. 
Now I want you to be honest with me. I want you to tell me what I do to stop you from being the husband I need you to be. Although you're half of our marriage problems, I'm the other half. I know I've done things in the past to hurt you, offend you, and turn you away from me. I know I do things now, every week, that bug you and keep you from opening up and talking with me. I know I'm guilty of killing our chances for intimacy, but I don't know exactly what these things are. You do. Honey, I need you to tell me what these things are. When I know what I'm, do- when I know what I'm doing wrong, I'll be able to stop making these mistakes. Don't tell me now, as though he would anyway. Take the next week and think and pray about it. Don't worry about hurting my feelings. Go for it. Don't spare me. Let me have it. I want to know. I need to know. I will not be angry or upset when you tell me. Make sure he knows that. Do not tell him at this first meeting what mistakes you think you've made. That'll make it too easy for him. It's important that he work on this assignment himself without any help from you. Do not let him off the hook. If he says, and he probably will right away, oh, I don't have anything to tell you, honey. Tell him, yes, you do. I want you to work on this. Fourth message, here's what I want from you. Tell him, there are three areas I want you to cover in your response. I'll tell you what they are. Then, so you have something to refer to, I'll give you this three by five card with the three points written on it. Please write down your answers so your message is clear and I can have a written record to refer to. Now, he can he can jot down things on his phone, of course, or his iPad if he wants, no big deal. First, you say to him, tell me what I have done to you in the past to offend and hurt you. If he has already written a letter of resentments, you can skip this category, but being an intimacy avoider, he probably hasn't done this. So you will need to ask for his resentments again. Go all the way back to the beginning of our relationship, you tell him. I harbored grudges against you for years, I admit it. I've told you about those. I'll bet you have some grudges against me, too. Please write them down. If he's got these resentments, they simply have to come out. Second, you tell him, let me know what I, what I do these days to turn you off and shut you up. Be as specific as you can. My behavior, my words, my attitude, whatever. How do I irritate you and prevent you from talking personally with me and meeting my needs? Third, describe what I can do specifically to help you open up and be closer to me. I know there are actions I can take that you'd love me to do, actions that would help you talk to me, pray with me, and be a team player with the kids and the housework. Finally, the fifth method, the fifth message. That's hard to say. If necessary, I'll talk to others. Tell him this, sweetheart, if you can't come up with specifics for me next week, I'll do my best to gather information on my mistakes from our kids, family members, and friends. These persons are close to us and have seen me interact with you many times. Sometimes a husband will work harder on this assignment because he would rather you not talk to others about your marital issues. Schedule the next meeting for one week in the future. Close by asking him to pray with you about this step in the program. If he won't, go ahead and say a brief prayer out loud, asking the Lord to help him write down the mistakes you have made and are still making that kill your intimacy. Now, before the next meeting, spend some time taking a good, hard look at yourself. Without talking to anyone, think about how you kill intimacy with your husband. What do you do that prevents him from connecting with you on a deeper level? After praying about this, brainstorm and write down all the possible ways you turn him away from conversation, romance, and treating you the way you want to be treated. Now, to help you with this task, in the next podcast, I'm going to cover four common waves wives kill intimacy. I think you'll recognize yourself in one or more of these patterns. It won't be fun to listen, but it's going to be, I think, very helpful to you to change the way you're acting and stop stopping intimacy with your husband. So until next time, David E. Clark, out.